my name is Audrey Scritchfield. Hi, my name is Isle Scritchfield. What you help a child in need? Hey, listeners, my girls and I would like to invite you to join us this holiday season in supporting a nonprofit we care very deeply about. It's called the Homeless Children's Playtime Project. If you visit wishlist.playtimeproject.org, you'll see an Amazon wish list for gifts that are requested to help a DC homeless child have a happier holiday. Again, it's wishlist.playtimeproject.org. Happy holidays! holidays. If you think it's time to take a hammer to your bathroom scale and rip up the diet rule book, well, welcome to Body Kindness. Hi, everyone. It's Rebecca Scritchfield, author of Body Kindness and host for this podcast. I'm a health at every size dietitian, a certified exercise physiologist, a former chronic dieter, and mom to two girls. Join me as I talk to guests about what it means to be good to ourselves and create a better life where well-being matters, not weight. Through these conversations, we'll reveal the challenging and surprising ways our culture keeps us searching for our worth and our appearance. So let's create a new view of health that's inclusive and built on compassion and respect for all bodies. Let's shake things up and let's change the game. I think most people who buy diet books might just read the diet books and never go on the diet. It's fantasy fiction. It's the idea that if you even in your own mind, if you can imagine a better world, if you can sort of envision your own participation in what could be read as a social movement, then you, in your mind, if not in your body, can sort of bring about or or realize a better self and a better world. That was Adrian Rose Batar. Adrian is a diet and food historian and recent author of Diet and the Disease of Civilization, the first historical study of diet books. Batar's book examines how four popular plans, paleo, biblical, primitive, and detox diets, reflect and shape our social world. Previous food publications include studies of competitive eating, food art, and the paleo diet. In the popular press, she has published on migrant child farm labor, locavorism, and weight gain diets. She also recently got a piece published in Wired about lab meat, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes. Batar earned her PhD from Stanford in 2016 and is currently a postdoctoral associate in history at Cornell. Batar's research project is on fake meat, and she teaches courses on food studies and the history of health and fitness culture. This is going to be an interesting one, folks. I'm not going to lie. I invite you to kind of strap in and examine, just listen to our conversation and just examine what it means. I feel like that this is one of those uh, thought-provoking episodes, you know, and it, it just kind of keeps you open to like a way of thinking literally like a historian. It is really hard for me to personally see anything helpful in diet books. Um, In my life, they were torture devices. They've caused me and pretty much all of my clients harm and shame. Um, You'll hear in our conversation where I point out um, diets coming from white males um, and even the roots of the official diet book actually showing examples in the text of weight stigma. So my hope for you is that this show will make you question any diet book that has ever been published. Um, We discuss mythical claims and the absurdity of past diet books and how it relates to the absurdity of today's diet culture. Goop comes up again. And, you know, I was even just reading this article on December 10th when I was just about to record this introduction that was in the New York Times about what do we actually really know about diet research. And I'll include that link in the show notes too. And the bottom line is, is not very much. But anyway, I really hope that you enjoy kind of learning something new and examining the history of diets and dieting and that you kind of enjoy our back and forth conversation. You know, I I really respect I really respect her book and her education and knowledge and that work and effort that she did um and bringing this book together. You know, as someone who is has this long history of chronic dieting and it was just so you know, against diet books, it was really interesting to kind of 
hear her examine how these books have come out at different cultural times and, you know, even like looking at the meanings of today's books. Um, So hopefully you'll pick up on some interesting insights and kind of one of those really makes you think. And I think it would be really awesome if you kind of start really challenging um, the things that show up in our culture. Really question, is this helpful? Do I think this will be personally helpful and meaningful to me? And be willing to walk away, you know, when the answer is no. And um, be willing to just feel better about the things that you are doing to help make your life better and that it's um, not likely to come from some promised salvation um, that is thrown at you in between some bound pages. Enjoy the show. Books make great gifts, and I would love to help you give the gift of body kindness this holiday season. Visit bodykindnessbook.com slash order, and you can order one or save some money when you order six or more copies. Again, that's bodykindnessbook.com slash order. The price includes shipping in the United States, and I'm happy to customize those orders. Also, don't forget, Body Kindness will be available on audiobook starting December 25th, 2018. You can order it now with your Audible credit for this month, or you can do an Audible trial and you'll actually be able to order it and get it free. So you can learn more at Audible by just searching for the term body kindness, and you'll find the page right there. Go ahead and pre-order. And then don't forget to visit bodykindnessbook.com slash presale. When you submit your proof of purchase, you will get some free goodies as a thank you for me where you can't get anywhere else. Happy holidays. Hey, Adrian, welcome to Body Kindness. Thank you so much for having me, Rebecca. I'm happy to be here. I am so excited to talk to you today. I first want to let listeners know how I came to find out about you. I always find that's a really fun and interesting way to start. So this is going to go back to um, someone who we are both probably following on Twitter, Alan Levinovitz. And he is the author of The Gluten Lie. And he's actually working on another book as as we are recording right now. But he, we share a literary agent. So his agent is my agent. And so we've met like at social gatherings and stuff. And he is a great guy. He did an awesome podcast about the religion of diets and diet culture. It was in um, within my first season, one of the first like experts I had on the show um, when I started bringing guests on. And it was really this fascinating conversation about how um, how restriction and diets have shown up in different contexts, you know, with him as a religious scholar, him kind of focusing on these sort of rituals and religious practices and how they relate to dieting practices. And so I'm always paying attention to him and what he's doing. And he knew about your book, which I'm holding in my hands. And it was before it was even out because... I know that he basically said directly to me, Rebecca, pre-order this book. And I'm telling you, I don't pre-order much like Brene Brown. Like there's a few people I pre-order, but I look and the title is Diet and the Disease of Civilization. And I'm like, okay, she's got me at that title because I think wellness culture even now, as much as it looks like health is actually very, very sick. And so I love to see diet, disease, and civilization in a title. So I pre-ordered you just so you know. (laughs) And, and I loved getting your book in the mail when it was out, um, launched. I loved reading it. And I thought we need to come on the podcast and talk about this. I'm having, um, a series where I talk to researchers and academics in a fun and helpful way for the average listener, but just to kind of, um, bring these topics to light and help people learn and grow in a little bit of a different way so we can really make more meaning of our past experiences and how how it affects us. So thank you for being here. I would love for you to start to share more about your background and training, and then uh, and then I want us to start and talk about your book right away. 
Oh, great. I've had a fairly long time in food studies as an academic. I mean, of course, just as a human being, I've always been very interested in food and intimately um, connected to ideas of body weight and uh, body image. But as an academic, I took my first food studies class in college in 2006, and I later went on to write a thesis on competitive eating. And I was always fascinated with the sort of drama and ritual, like Alan's book shows so well, the drama and ritual of food and eating and how that re- relates to our sense of ourselves as, as really just like the human condition more broadly. So when I looked at competitive eaters, I saw the sort of theater of human experience and the, the sort of pain and joys of public eating. And then I went to graduate school. I got my PhD at Stanford. And I decided to read diet books as literature. And it was, it was a tough decision because it, it meant that I had to sort of sweep away all the ugliness of diet culture mm-hmm. and actually encounter these texts as texts, as stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves, as stories that reflect the human experience, as stories that have shaped our culture in really profound ways. So I... Um, I read a lot of diet books and I learned about the history of nutrition and I came to see these things as hugely influential and fundamental works that have shaped our literary imagination and our experience of ourselves and, and as, as, you know, human beings interacting with the world and, and shaping our concepts of beauty and health. Mm-hmm. So like, kind of like, like anthropology for diet books, right? Like you had to neutralize yourself and observe what Mm. you were seeing in the text and then make inferences about what it means about us as a society. Yeah, exactly. Like it was really hard. I think a lot of people still have a hard time with this is to look at diet books as separate from diet culture. Mm -hmm. Because if you actually read the books themselves, it's like a secret hiding in plain sight. You'll see a lot of wellness language in really sort of sincere and direct ways in which the authors of the diet books are very empathetic, sort of promote um, a very inclusive understanding of beauty and body weight. And I think it was really the diet culture and the commercialization that kind of twisted this language and made it even uglier and something we now see as diet culture today. Hmm. That's very interesting. So with with, with that um, insight, could you share more about specifically about your book and how it's laid out, what you talk about, and to help us understand a little bit better? Yeah, I loved writing this book. So I was faced with a task. I was getting a dissertation. I was getting a PhD, so I had to sort of legitimate it. I looked originally at the 17,000 titles housed on WorldCat, which is the online cat, uh, catalog of all the books circulating in the public libraries in the United States. Um, so there's 17,000 diet books under reducing diet. And I went through each one, just the title, and I started to categorize them, like just draw out the general themes. And one thing that stuck out to me immediately was that they were all commenting on the big project of like humankind and our understanding our sort of relationship to the civilizing process. Mm -hmm. So all of them, for the majority, asked this really big question of like, who is natural man? Like, when did he live and what kind of life did he live out? And what did he eat? So my four chapters map out four different answers to that question, which is, you know, first we descended from the paleo people and they were natural and they were healthy and they were beautiful. And we just need to mimic those original paleolithic ways today. Mm -hmm. That's how we recover our natural beauty and health. And then we transitioned to the biblical or Eden diets, which said, no, 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 it's not the cave. We just need to return to the sort of vegetarian lifestyles of Adam and Eve. That's how we'll become like, we'll reveal our true selves and reconnect with nature and God and feel true intimacy and all of these like beautiful dreams wrapped up in a mythic understanding of the past that really condemn the present. So then I looked at sort of primitive diets, so-called, which look at sort of earlier civilizations before colonialism came in and corrupted uh, corrupted modern bodies. And then finally, I looked at detox, which located the sort of beautiful paradise of the past before the Industrial Revolution in the 1880s. So in all of these, you see this narrative of civilization that said, 
at one point we lived in beauty with sort of a natural intuitive understanding of our appetite in God's grace, but something happened and we have fallen as a people and we need to regain that original health through diet. Mm. So, I mean, that really, it really seems to me to tell the story of that there are actions that you can take that will somehow make you better than you are right now. Yes. And I feel like in some ways I'm just like, er, I can kind of see body kindness in there, right? Like create a better <laughs> life. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's not, it's not your weight. What are personally meaningful choices that you can make around food and not obsess over food? And, you know, so, so, so it's like, I can see that there's, that there are betterment components even in something like my book, which is like, reject all this diet culture BS, you know, that there's still this, I mean, I know what I was thinking in my mind too, was how to answer the question like, okay, so I've tried these different diets and they haven't delivered on the promise, Mm -hmm. right? My life isn't better and I have anxiety and shame and I don't weigh any less. In fact, I've gained weight, you know, things that we see in biological studies. And so you feel like you're at this rock bottom and it's like, Mm -hmm. but wait a minute, but I still care about health. Do I have to give up? Do I have to give up the fact that I want, you know, to eat healthy food, you know, because I want to be around a long time or do I have to give Mm -hmm. up on exercise? Like, does it mean that I don't do any do I, I don't exercise at all if I'm going to, you know, reject the ways in which mm-hmm. exercise is harmful. And so I was like, what I, what, what I want people to know is that you don't have to, well, first of all, participating in the diet culture ways, if you're not happy, there's a reason you're reading this book. And so let's sort of take a different frame of it acknowledging biological research out there about diets not working, acknowledging the research on stigma and shame and body image and acknowledging those relationships. And at the same time, you don't have to hand in that card of caring about your health. It's just the way that you, the way that you look at health and well-being Mm -hmm. and how, how to kind of better make decisions that are workable for you in a way that might remind you of participating in diets. Um, but then your work and your effort is on, on reframing there. Like I still encourage, you know, people to eat in a balanced way. It's just that to your point, right. Somebody who down your paleo line, somebody would have bread on the plate, whether that's a sourdough from an amazing bakery Mm -hmm. with homemade butter or a piece of wonder bread, like bread could still be on, you know, a body kindness plate, but in the paleo world, that would be shunned. Um, and on the detox, you know, realm, if there was something that was had sugar believed to create inflammation, that might get rejected. But in the balanced way, that would be part of your eating pattern. So, Mm -hmm. you know, but there's, yeah, you know, I just think that this idea of, you know, that even in this, anti-diet book, right? That there that there is still this promise of your life could be better mm-hmm, if mm-hmm. you read and apply what's in here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it's a story that's very persuasive. One of the things I was taken by actually doing my interviews with dieters mm-hmm. or with people who read diet books mm-hmm. is that for many people and myself included, it's just an exercise in imagination. Hmm. Like, I think most people who buy diet books might just read the diet books and never go on the diet. It's fantasy fiction. It's the idea that if you, even in your own mind, if you can imagine a better world, if you can sort of envision your own participation in what could be read as a social movement, then you, in your mind, if not in your body, can sort of bring about or or realize a better self and a better world. So in a lot of ways, these books sort of, they, they capture your imagination without needing to actually involve your body in these, you know, methods of restriction and the sort of, you know, the ill-intended effects that so many diets have. So not only do people sometimes indulge in the pleasures of reading diet books without actually going on a diet or considering themselves to, to be possibly going on a diet. Also, if you read the books, they're not really diet books. So I sort of calculated back the envelope of the 400 or so that I carefully analyzed less than 10, 15% of the books are actually diets. 
the other, you know, 80, 85% of the books are these philosophical screeds, like articulating mankind's role in the cosmos, understanding our, the human condition. Like these are big sort of generous narratives of human history. Mm -hmm. And the idea that that could be played out in your breakfast, lunch, dinner decisions is totally surprising. Um, That these decisions we make are so freighted with not only our understanding of ourselves as human beings, but the fate of civilization, Mm -hmm. like you can't get bigger than that. And that is why I was so attracted to these powerful books, because they're not just a myth Mm -hmm. of a lost golden age. And they're not just a manual for your breakfast, lunch, dinner, proteins, fats, carbohydrates, decisions. It's a manifesto for a better world. Mm-hmm. Like these are social plans to recognize and to bring about a world of like beauty and harmony and health and whatever that might mean. So it can mean something really ugly um, and full of shame, or it can mean something really liberating and full of joy. Yeah. So that's how I think of them as myths, mm-hmm. manuals, and manifestos. Hmm. Well, I lo- there there's so many interesting things that you're saying and that it's sort of like challenging my brain right now. And so I'm like, okay, you know, so if I go along with this, you know, if I go along with this idea that they're like comments on a better world, again, I, I feel deeply passionate that that's what body kindness is about. And in fact, it's not like laid out in sort of a core literal sense this is the goal of the book. But even in part four, where I talk about where you belong, like I'm trying to help people spend so much less time participating in the self-evaluations that diet culture perpetuates Mm -hmm. and really create a more meaningful life because even though we can't change cultural oppressions and, and there are things that we can't control, whether there's financial limitations, time limitations, geographic limitations, we can still create a meaningful and purposeful life, especially if we realize we wasted a lot of time trying to conform to that promised land. And so that's going to be, that was going to be my hook back to, okay, so if I go along with this, that it is a, it's, you know, that there's myth there that we could somehow through eating create a promised perfect world, it sounds like, like a perfectionism and, you know, and a manifesto toward this perfect, better world right? That to me, what historically they're getting wrong, I'm going to guess because you're the history expert. I'm going to let you (laughs) answer. But to me, I would say what we're getting wrong is the connection between weight. Like you're only allowed access to this promise, this mythical Mm -hmm. promise. If you follow these rules and you lose weight as a result, like you're excluded, you're not allowed if you don't lose weight. Mm -hmm. And that is a fairly new concept. If you're thinking historically, Mm -hmm. the sort of religious and spiritual condemnations of sort of lustful eating or gluttony Mm -hmm. were not affiliated or or they were not associated with weight. So this Mm -hmm. is a really interesting and important point Mm -hmm. that used to be that, let's say before William Banting published in like the 1860s or so, Mm -hmm. that you could be condemned as being a sinner for being a glutton. Mm-hmm. And that had no bearing on your physical body weight. Mm. And the the reverse was true, that someone could be a heavier individual, but that wasn't necessarily indicative of having a, a improper relationship to food. So that relationship that we see today was about between eating and food habits and body weight wasn't necessarily direct until I would say like the end of the 19th century. Mm. Well, let's let's look at that window. I know about banting. Um, <laughs> but I know I'm sure listeners don't, but it, 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 I include banting in a lot of my professional talks. Actually, I think it's fascinating to me personally to see it, you know, like how everything old is new again, and mm-hmm. it is known as the first diet book, but what could you share for listeners just who may have never heard of him before? What can you share what you know about him and, and the book? Yeah, in 1863, so most scholars will say this is the first like modern diet book. Okay. Because before that, there was lots of religious reform. Like Kellogg and Graham would say, you know, you can have lustful appetites for food, but we don't really care about your weight. That's not important. Okay. But Banting, so wait, so let's pause yeah. there because we know Kellogg. So you do want to explain Kellogg, the name is still around. Oh, right? Yeah. 
So John Harvey Kellogg and Sylvester Graham, Sylvester Graham sort of predated Kellogg, but these were religious reformers who could condemn lustful appetites that spoke to like improper sexual appetites and appetites for food um, without weighing in on on weight, to be honest. Right. Uh, And both males, both white males, right? So yes. Okay. And Kellogg ended up creating the Kellogg cereal, right? The company. Kellogg? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he had the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan. He mm-hmm. treated Thomas Edison, Warren Harding, Sojourner Truth, just an amazing who's who of the rich and famous Mary Todd Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, uh, he was very committed to the vegetarian cause, mm-hmm. not necessarily for animal rights or environmental reasons, but because he believed that animal foods, animal flesh stimulated the appetites, both for uh, sort of for gluttonous indulgence in mm. sex and in food. Mm. But again, this wasn't didn't have bearing on weight. Weight, I get it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's but interesting. It's just fascinating that the company is still around, right? Like, oh yeah, he was a real entrepreneur. Yeah. He, uh, this is where we got granola as well. Mm-hmm. And then Graham is graham cracker. Yes, he is. <laughs> Except the graham cracker we have today is definitely not what he had what, in mind. Yeah, well, yeah. I remember reading in your book. It sounded like sawdust. It sounded <laughs> awful. But uh, you, yeah. you, you tell these stories in the book, so we can learn about them more there. Yeah. Okay. So back. So so. But I appreciate this is a good and interesting distinction. So so we've got the religious component. I'm hearing you on like it. It it was about sin and sex and all these other things. There was a religious background and then that evolved. But Banting was the first modern diet book and his was about weight loss, right? He's like, I lost 50 pounds or something, right? So what can you tell us about him? So he is sort of, um, he's infamous in diet history. He went on a low carbohydrate diet. Um, he's British man Mm -hmm. undertaker. He went on a low carbohydrate diet prescribed by his doctor and lost quite a bit of weight. And his diet was something like not very interesting. It was a lot of meats. It was a lot of like stewed fruits. He included alcohol. Twice, twice, twice a day, lunch and dinner, he drank. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, really? Yeah, it sounds like a pretty good diet. Um, But it made a splash because it, first of all, was a bestseller. This was right around the time that like, you know, mass media could produce and promote these, these. It became a blockbuster hit because his voice was approachable to the common man. He wasn't like John Harvey Kellogg or Sylvester Graham, like coming down off his pulpit saying, you sinners down there, like how dare you indulge in these excesses? He was saying, I understand. Like I was once in your shoes. Like I was, he has this really sort of compassionate moment in the book or the pamphlet. He says, I was subjected to the taunts and the cruel sneers of little boys making fun of me as a fat man in London. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like I was humiliated. This was my shame. And I'm here to rescue you because I understand you. So it was a real difference between the sort of on high uh, soapbox narrative of Kellogg and Graham to this really modern sort of empathetic understanding that I succeeded and you can too. I believe in you. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is mind blowing to me because when I hear you say that, I would acknowledge it as perhaps also the first inclination that weight stigma is a real thing, right? So in our, in our groups, if you don't fit in, you deserve to be othered, you deserve to be tormented And what he is really seeking is freedom from oppression, Uh but he's selling it through conformity. If I can, if I can just hang on, right? Look, Mm -hmm. I still get my alcohol, but if I can cut out this, (laughs) this and that, if I can just control myself, which would follow in the religious control, right? Mm -hmm. If I could just control myself, I will fit in and be accepted in that liberation, that freedom, is what I'm really seeking. Yeah. And, and that, I mean, this is, this is today's message. We are still yeah. educating people about the terms, weight stigma, about culture. Like, so that's fascinating to me yeah. to hear you talk about him telling a story about, and again, it, from my perspective at this point, it's stigmatizing trope, right? I was the sad fat person, you know, yeah. but in reality, it's his lived experience. And 
he may have been accidentally, like so many people do, putting the weight as the thing of I solve my problems and this mm-hmm. was bad and this is good. But really what became good was reduced oppression, reduced stigma yeah. and finally fitting in it. And how va- how valuable is that to us as a as a species? Like I've mm-hmm. never asked anyone that question before. Can you can you elaborate on that? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but just like <laughs> as as for what you know about human beings and fitting in, it's like critical, right? Oh, being ostracized or feeling like you're not part of a group is this, I mean, that's why they put people in isolation and as a form of punishment. I mean, you don't want, you want to feel belonging. We're social, we're social creatures. Mm -hmm. And when Banting, he has another story about having to walk downstairs sideways Mm. um, because he was ostensibly because he was so large and the, the, the humiliation he experienced when other people, especially little boys, I guess, would jeer at him walking down sideways or not being able to stoop over to tie his own shoes. Mm -hmm. That is when humiliation and pain really comes through. Mm -hmm. And the thing he's doing is he's exposing that humiliation and pain in a public forum, in a blockbuster diet Mm -hmm. to better empathize with his readers. Right. And I just wonder, will we ever know, did he have a metabolic problem, you know, will we ever know, did, could he have had an eating disorder? Like, you know, yeah. I, don't, I don't, we would be limited by the science at the time by, by medicine. And then at that time, it was sort of an interesting point. It was when body weight originally signified uh, wealth and power and prestige and the ability to afford these, you know, highly mm-hmm. caloric foods. And then as we're sort of modernizing, you know, this is when the civil war was happening in the United States, industrial revolution, then it became more of a sign of um, excess and um, sort of a distasteful condition. Mm-hmm. So he's sort of a bridge figure between the different significations of body weight. Mm-hmm. Do you have time to jump ahead and to talk about um, Dr. Lulu Hunter Peters, 1918? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so she's wonderful. She's the first, I would consider her to be the first American diet book author. And Mm -hmm. she's an incredible figure. So she was a medical doctor. She published uh, Diet and Health with Key to the Calories in 1918. And in it, actually the first page, she had to uh, include a pronunciation guideline for calorie because no one, this was the first time people understood this like magical element in food somehow translated to energy. Like it didn't, that didn't really like ring, that wasn't an easy sell at the time because Mm -hmm. it was Like this was an apple and this was a banana. It's hard to think of one having 120 calories and one having 100. It didn't really make sense. But she also was very compassionate. She was also funny. She included these little stick figures and funny puns. Um, She sort of the in the testimonial style, she included stories of Mrs. Like weigh a ton, Mrs. I'm a gobbler. Like so it was very empathetic, but funny, but also oppressive. Yeah. Um, but her main contribution was political, where she volunteered with the American Red Cross during World War I and participated in their, their hunger aid. Mm. And the book was dedicated with permission to Herbert Hoover, who, as you may know, has been credited with saving more lives than anyone who's ever lived with his famine relief mm-hmm. um, in Belgium and the Soviet Union. So she argued that Weight loss, this is a complicated thing, weight loss not only corresponded with health and beauty, but it also was a sign of moral virtue because, as she said, every pang of hunger you feel Mm -hmm. is a pang of hunger you're uh, alleviating from a starving child in Belgium. Hmm. So it was very, um, it was, it was freighted with politics, with religion, with health and uh, a form of body conformity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I could see, I guess, I mean, I don't even know. I wish you were around so I could ask her specifically, but it was, you know, hunger is a sign that you need nourishment and, you know, our civilization is around because we are able to get access to food. So if, Mm -hmm. if, if I could note, I could see how feeling hunger, you know, in the modern world, feel hunger, be grateful that you have that connection to your body and be grateful that you have access to any food, let alone food preferences. Mm -hmm. And certainly in this day and age, we, you know, in DC, I live two miles away from, from a food bank and, Mm -hmm. you know, like there's, you know, how do we have so much food and so much hunger 
now in present day in our country. So I could see a benefit of that, you know, but not like, hey, restrict because when you're hungry, think of all the other starving people, I guess, but more of like, I don't know, I would rather in per have it more of like a connection of a gratitude for what you do have access to and your yeah. privileges. At this time though, there was a very, it's, it's, there was a very direct connection between, mm-hmm. um, conservation on the home front and food aid abroad. Mm-hmm. So it, it could have been possible that the, the food you conserved here mm-hmm. could actually have been shipped abroad to in today's global world. Mm-hmm. That's not like the reason why we have famine today is not because of a lack of calories. Mm -hmm. It's because of a lack of political access. Okay. So no matter how much you dieted here, you're not going to save people from famine in South Sudan, but it actually could have been possible in her time back then. So that's, that's interesting, right? So I don't have to sit there and be like, she's a monster right? (laughs) because you're actually helping me again, make sense of, yeah. In modern world, we would call like your hunger your hunger pain should keep you restricting calories. I would call that disordered. But what you're saying is in the time and her reality, her, what she was promoting in the betterment of a world went to a political sense of if you care about being anti-hunger, you, I'm probably softening what she says, but you respecting your body signals will help somebody else in need directly. Yeah. But the, dark side of that is that people who didn't conform to her idea of normal body size were considered sort of (laughs) anti-humanitarian. Like that's horrible. It's like you're storing excess fat calories on your body Mm -hmm. and that's selfish because a a starving child could use those. Right. And what we know now about, and again, we're still learning, but like about research and metabolism and, and, and even the ability for, we know there's a natural size diversity. We know that there are, Mm -hmm. you know, genetic variables and we know that humans haven't evolved that much DNA wise between 1918 and now. So to know, even though there's food system differences and a lot of differences that we could compare. The reality of it is, is that a person would be judged based on their appearance and that, that, that they were a particular type of uncaring, yeah. cute, callous human, even if under the hood is being in their biology or maybe even the dieting itself caused the weight cycle. <laughs> Yeah, it's that's luckily, you know what? Luckily, we don't have that element of weight prejudice today. <laughs> You're not considered like, yeah. you know, cruel to the hungry in the world, but that was an unfortunate consequence of her sort of humanitarian approach to mm-hmm. food and dieting. Well, this has been a really interesting conversation so far. And I think that there's a lot of understanding in my in in my own sense of you know, I feel like in, in, in my, like what I try to do a lot with people, whether it's in a counseling setting or speaking is I try to help people see kind of like how long this BS has been going on. And I tend to start with banting and really just kind of reference back to him, but I feel like you're giving me some more people to mention. Um, so thank you for that. And at the same time, I also tend to bring in the the first ad for the bathroom scales in mm, and I usually mm-hmm. do the US so it's like I think it's 1918 1919 which correlates with uh with Lulu Hunter Peters book cuz the company is still around the Health Meter company and you know I I will usually share an ad and it's like you know daily weighing for self control mm-hmm. and the deterrent to eating so it makes sense right where you see what's going on in culture and this book and now we have this invention that we literally had no use for <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to decide to put it in the bathroom and we're going to show a picture of a woman in her bathrobe and her coffee mug weighing herself as the thing to do for health right and you examine i've examined have you examined these ads before by the way, do you- I I am familiar with the penny scales. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So penny scales were, it, to my understanding, they were kind of like novelties. Like, oh, go to mm-hmm. a movie, put a penny in, mm-hmm. and step on the scale. But they made a ton of money, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. tens of thousands of dollars. And so eventually, it was just a matter of it was a business decision, right? Mm-hmm. Like this is the, what culture's doing. Let's get the technology right. But they got the technology right. But they need somebody needed to figure out 
where is the, okay, this is going to be a device in every home, but there's no need for it. Where are we going to put this device? We have to make one up. I mean, and advertising is really what did it. It was creating a new market. And if you think of, I mean, I'm still making videos with a hammer and smashing scales and asking (laughs) people to smash their scale as a part of liberation, right? But this was like a, you know, a early 1900s, torture device, yeah. basically, that said, do this every day for health and <laughs> happiness and satisfaction, i.e., right, more conformity. Right. And something that was interesting in their ads, too, is uh, saying um, kind of co-opting medicine. You know, uh-huh. I, I I remember one of the ads that said kind of like use our guidebook with methods approved by like the New York Academy of Medicine, right? Uh-huh. So it's like, if we want to build trust, consumer trust in products, and if we want, you know, consumers to trust that they need something, let's back it up with a medical claim. And I see those things as still very prevalent tactics mm-hmm. for creating a need and a market. Mm-hmm. You know, why do we have the 60 billion plus dieting industry today? Is it really about health? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's like who invented uh, halitosis? <laughs> the Listerine. Listerine. <laughs> like, yeah, you invent a problem, you invent a solution, then you invent a problem. <laughs> mm. And toothpaste too. I think that that's another one. Anyway, I digress. The point of it is I, I think it's helpful to examine, you know, all the different factors that make up who we are. That's what I found so fascinating about your book. It really, I mean, doing the work of, I need to be this neutral anthropologist, reading them as straight up text, not as, you know, and find the similarities, categorize them out, try to help people um, Mm -hmm. build a different understanding and sensibility. I don't think that you're trying to say, this is what makes a good diet book and this is what makes a bad diet book. And you're not trying to like, like maybe I would write some sort of rant of like, screw all this shit and put it in the dumpster <laughs> and just ignore. like, you're really trying to make sense of it to connect it back to humanity. It's the lived experience that you can't ignore of, you know, millions of people across the last hundred years. I mean, this is how, if for a lot of ways, people made sense of themselves and sense of their place in the world and sense of themselves as human beings, you know, making daily decisions about what to eat and how to live. So it would be doing history a disservice to just forget about that entire swath of, of the corpus of, um, cultural products. Right. I mean, and I would argue that the making sense of it is, is also helps the healing. Yeah, I would agree because if you're going to look back at a lifetime of dieting and just dismiss it as, you know, irrelevant failure, then you're doing yourself a disservice too. Cause on this whole time you were questing for something, whether or not it was you were questing to lose 20 pounds or you were questing for a bigger life or you're searching for some greater meaning that should in itself be acknowledged as a pursuit of something. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that process needs to be validated so it can be uh, deconstructed. Yeah. Like if you just say, oh, these people were ignorant, they were misled, they were slaves to the beauty industry, then you're ignoring that entire, you know, I think it's it's really unfair and um, closed minded to mm-hmm. not recognize the value of that experience. I also think it doesn't let you examine what's happening today and look mm-hmm. at, I'll take one of the most extreme sentences, right? But like how today and like goop right, is Mm -hmm. the manifestation of, you know, what could have happened a while ago, just in today's culture. And um, Gwyneth Paltrow's interview in the New York Times Magazine flat out said, we're doing well because we are aspirational. Right. And by definition, being aspirational, there will always be people left out. You will always leave people striving for more and wanting for more. Yeah. And so it is today's version of, you know, really examining what are we looking for as a culture. And in one sense, I think that there is this everlasting life promise back to the religion, how much has really changed. Yeah. Also, just as humans, how do we even look at 
death, right? We have a fear of death and think that if there are things that we could do to prevent it, that we're good and better humans. Oh yeah. That's where I think it gets really dangerous too, with like positive thinking Mm -hmm. and this kind of sort of willed mindfulness. If you ignore the history of dieting, you might think of these things as sort of new inventions, but it also puts the blame on the sufferer in a way. Mm -hmm. Someone gets sick and the promises you can think your way out of it or you can believe your way out of it, it's almost uh, finger pointing, I would say. And Barbara Ehrenreich has a really good book about this and blaming the sufferer for their own, you know, failings. Mm -hmm. And that is the the absolute wrong thing to do. And that should be the thing that we should looking at is relieving ourselves of that self-blame and self-flagellation and looking toward what can I do now? What, what can help me as I am right now? And yeah, just, I know that we're wrapping up here in in the last um, couple of minutes, but it's, it, it is also the beneficial purpose I see with that. So it's like looking at the modern versions of what is the promise so that we can better challenge and question, is this helpful to me? Also embrace dying as a reality of living. And to your point, let's reduce healthism and not blame individuals as, oh, well, had you just done this, you would have prevented Mm -hmm. that, right? Mm -hmm. Looking at all those things. And then I also, you know, getting back to cultural and political factors, but even this realm of who are supposed to be the healers medicine, Right. But there are also flaws in medicine. Um, I'm thinking of the book Doing Doing Harm by Maya Dusenberry, who was a former guest. She basically talks about how lazy medicine can ignore women's mm-hmm. needs and mm-hmm. women's pains are ignored. So then you look at, OK, so could women be gravitating to goop because their doctor's not listening to yeah. them and they and yeah. they want to heal themselves. I mean, can you blame a person for wanting to feel better and for taking action when they're not being listened to in medicine? You know, so I know I'm waxing philosophical, but these are the things I think about on a daily basis. Well, I did. I was at a conference once and someone had the very clever idea to test how vitamin water's popularity like waxed and waned with healthcare, health insurance. So her argument was that as, you know, as people got, you know, more and more scared, they might lose their health insurance. That's one of the reasons why sort of different potions and snake oils became so popular is because, you know, what, what else do you have if you, if you don't have recourse to traditional medicine, maybe vitamin water has the answer. (laughs) So it's really sad. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Or now it's like, pH neutral or who knows what (laughs) it's, it's some type of tonic that's going to heal. And as you said, it's myths and fiction. And I, I, one of your most powerful quotes, I hope you don't mind if I read, but it's Mm -mm. page 149, um, as you're concluding the book and, and you say every diet book is a powerful fiction that instructs retelling age old myths to live by meal by meal, day by day. They recount the narrative backbone of American culture, that familiar story of the fall of man and the fall of a once blessed nation. Mm -hmm. Even if a dieter never loses weight, the continued popularity of the diet book story reveals how Americans are willing to work and ready to hope. Following a diet means plotting yourself into a shared dream to remake a lost world and make it better this time around. That's so nice. That's so nice of you to read that quote. Yeah, it's maybe it's a little bit optimistic, but I do see if you look at the sources and you listen to the emotional currents that run through them you'll see a compassionate and empathetic and diverse understanding of the struggles that we've all gone through and how it means to be alive and the challenges, Mm -hmm. the challenges of, of, of everyday living. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I love that the way that you could contextualize the beneficial purpose and the examination 
And what I get out of reading that quote from from where I sit as a helping professional who did all the worst dieting things you can imagine. I mean, before there was Fitbit, I found a device that was clinical and I, you know, put it on people's arms and said, I'm going to watch you. Come on, I'm going to help you with calorie counts, like some of the worst things. So it's like, if I can reform, if I can see things differently, if we can do that, you know, that is what I would call listeners to examine, right? So it's like to read your book, to understand the context and the purpose and the meaning behind it, and then say, maybe it's time we actually start to look at what does it mean to Mm -hmm. have a better world, a better society? You Mm -hmm. know, that is what needs our focus. And for for me, it's more inclusive, right? Race, Mm -hmm. gender, sexual orientation, size, all all the isms. Yeah. That that's is what million, we need to look at. And that's the million dollar question. Cause what kind of world is it? <laughs> and that's the danger. It's like, are you going to create a world that's totally exclusive and limited and has these sort of artificial distinctions between people? Or are you going to create a world that actually encompasses all the good values that many of these diet books actually espouse? Mm-hmm. Well, only time will tell and only yeah. the um, the people who control the media, I guess, will. Because as we know, social media has its impacts, podcasting, yeah. publishing, it all. We'll, ha- we'll, we'll have to see and observe. Um, thank you so much for coming on and spending all this time. How can people find and connect with you? Of course, they're going to buy the book and I'll include all those <laughs> links. But But what else would you like to say if people want to pay attention to what you're doing? Um, yeah, please first buy the book. Um, it's my first book. Uh, it's a diet and the disease of civilization, Adrian Rose Batar. I've also published, uh, in some popular outlets I've written for, um, if you just search my name online and then Twitter is Adrian Batar, A-D-R-I-E-N-N-E, B-I-T-A-R. And I have most of my publications also posted free access on LinkedIn. Well, that's wonderful. I'll be sure to include those links in the show notes. And thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you, Rebecca. This is wonderful. And that's a wrap on today's show. Let's continue the conversation on Facebook. Just search Body Kindness Podcast and click to join. And if you can contribute to the production costs for the 2018 podcast season, visit gofundme.com slash body kindness. We love ratings and reviews. Please do that. And don't forget to let your friends know that body kindness is one of your can't miss podcasts. If you have questions, comments, or guest recommendations, shoot me an email, Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com.